You're listening to Shoe In, covering the ins and outs of all things footwear, from sneakers to heels, loafers to slippers, and every type of shoe in between. Brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion. Helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. Hey, Shoe and Show listeners, welcome back to another amazing edition of the world's greatest shoe business podcast. Maybe the only shoe business podcast, but that means you're the greatest. So uh, we have we have longevity. Our, our guest today is someone who's been on before. Um, he's a barn burner. He's a critical thinker. And it's just another sign that, Sandy, that shoe in is for everybody. If you're in the industry and you're part of the industry and you're you're analyzing and discussing and critiquing the industry, and you're also a fan of the industry, uh, you're always welcome on this program. And today's guest is no different. And so he's been here before. We brought him back. We're going to find out if that was a mistake or not. But tell us who is on Shoe and Show today, Sandy. I think some people have already guessed um, who's joining today. Um, it's Sam Poser, equity analyst. Um, with Williams Trading. Welcome, Sam. We're thrilled to have you on and to hear some of your predictions and thoughts about 2024. So welcome, Sam. Thank you very much for having me. This will be fun. Um, I know you've been here before. I know you, most people in the industry um, know you um, very well. You're pretty open about your um, thoughts and your views. And and we like that because we not, we need to hear what's really happening, what's really cooking, the truth. Um so I'd like to get started by asking you about some of the key industry trends that you're following this year, what you're excited to see, some, some of your followings and what, what your views are. So, I mean, I'm less, I'm actually, I think comfort as a product trend sort of, sort of still overwhelms the space. And I mean, you know, on the dress side, you're seeing more on women's, you're seeing more platforms or flats, you're not seeing as many heels. I mean, I think last year, people, women tried to buy heels, and then all of a sudden, they said, why did I do this? And so all of a sudden, now I'm starting to see a lot more flats and, and platforms did quite well last year. But I think comfort sort of just, you know, if it's sneakers or casual shoes or whatever, I think it just over, you know, people aren't willing to be uncomfortable even when they dress up. And that, I think that from a product perspective is, um, is important. However, I, I think that the main trend out there for brands and for retailers is you better be focused, you better know your customer and you better execute against it. And no matter how good your product is, if you don't allocate it properly or over distribute it, you got big, big problems. And um, I mean, I've been writing about keep, you know, less is more um, consistently. Um, and one is, you know, keep supply below demand. Don't try to, uh, for those who, brands that sell wholesale, don't try to, you know, think you did great because you had a huge sell in to some retailer. If the consumer that shops at that retailer, isn't interested in whatever it is you just sold them. Um, and for the retailers, and, and for both, but for the retailers as well, measuring demand, accurately understanding what that demand is, and not from some buyer that says, oh, I have a million dollars in open to buy here, let me buy a bunch of that item. No, it's, it's what's that, cons how many are you really going to sell, what price you're going to sell it at, um, and... Um, and, uh, you know, and, and really keep working that way versus um, trying to fill space so we can have a nice assortment. Um, you know, these nice assortments end up at even nicer markdowns all the time. Yeah, well, let's talk about markdowns. Let's talk about inventory as it relates to markdowns. Sam, you know that we were in this environment where we, we chased product because demand was super uh, elevated. Uh, and then it's you know, if it's flowed in and we've been sitting on a ton of inventory and companies have been making decisions on how they distribute that product and how, how do they push it out? Uh, and, and we've been tracking, we have a quarterly report that tracks all the publicly traded footwork companies and their inventory positions. And, and so far, you know, we're seeing through third quarter of 23 and the fourth quarter that inventory levels are coming down. Imports are down dramatically, which is again, another kind of key indicator that the inventory uh, is inventory is being right size. 
but it's still historically elevated relative to where we typically are on inventory level. So how are you thinking about inventory in 24? We keep, we continuously hear at our markets that we're slowly selling through it. When are we getting to the point where it's not even a question in people's minds and we're actually kind of level set on the inventory question? Well, I'm looking forward to answering that same question over the next few years with you. Um, uh, I think there's a couple things. Um, one, inventories are coming down relative to their peaks. The problem is, is that those peaks were so high that they need to come down more than everybody thinks. And, and what happens is a lot of the companies, and it happens internally you know, at retailers as well, where, you know, they go, well, you know, our inventory is down and our business is up. But, but if you're, you know, I look at, you know, you you know, most on average, I think brands and retailers should be carrying like no more than 15, 16 weeks of forward supply. And you have numbers up to 20. In some cases, you have numbers in the, in the, you know, you know, six months, and, and so, again, it's all about, as I mentioned before, looking at demand and looking at what you're going to sell. And the, so, the, so, the, so it's good that the inventory levels are coming down from a, from a quantity perspective. But, but from a quality, what ends up happening is I think the good stuff's selling and the bad stuff's not moving. And I think people are just hoping there's one day that they can sell a lot of stuff at closer to regular price rather than take your medicine – blow it out so then you can really get back to work on the new product that people want. Because the one thing that I definitely think that's happening today is people people aren't shopping anymore. And by that, I mean they're buying, but they're not shopping. So they come, they go, they look online or whatever, they go into a store, or they go online, they expect to have what you what they want. And if they didn't want it yesterday – at a hundred dollars, it's unlikely they're going to want it tomorrow at a hundred dollars. And the faster you can bring that price down, you might find that person that does it. But if you're going to sit around like some companies have done in the past in the spring, oh, we've had a cold spring, so sandals aren't selling. But if you expected to sell a thousand sandals in March and you only sold 500 and the customers come into the store, look online and see that same sandal sitting there, they're not going to want that sandal later. You've got to get rid of it so you can bring new fresh product in. But, um, you know, brands and retailers, I, I, I think they're, I, I just don't think they measure demand properly when they're buying product and when they're, you know, and as the, as the year goes on. That's interesting. Um, and I'm curious to go back to your point about fresh product and new product and newness. And, and you say, study your, your customer. Um, I'm curious about your perspective on whether the brands are bringing enough fresh product or are they, or in your opinion, are they playing it a little bit too safe? <laughs> that's a funny question. Um, and I don't I mean funny and that's a good question, but it's funny because it, what it, it, the question is what is safe? And I used to work at Bloomingdale's a long time ago. And when we had a bad, like macro was terrible and everything. And they said, be careful, play safe. So the dress shirt buyer there bought a lot of white and a lot of blue dress shirts. And he bought some pattern dress shirts too. Well, the white and the blue dress shirts sat and rotted and they had to mark them down. They thought that was safer. Sorry. They thought that was safer, but, and the, and the pattern sold out. And why did that happen? Because everybody already owned a white and a blue dress shirt. And so if, you know, oh, you're going to buy a lot of black pumps or a lot of black wingtips. I mean, that's a, that's not safe. And again, that goes back to knowing your customer, what's going to get them out of bed. So, so, so safe can be new, but you got to do it in a very measured way. And the problem is some companies are in such a hard time now that they can't afford to be measured because they need the sales. But then if they drive the sales, then they hurt the brand. So you get like, a, you know, two steps forward, one step back scenario. I mean, in my all of my coverage, without naming any names, I mean, I have three companies I really think are executing exceptionally, really executing well. Other ones are doing a very good job, but but it hasn't quite clicked over. And then I think a lot of them are, you know, our our hope is, you know, as I said to my clients, hope is not an investment. Right. You know, what if, let, let's talk about the successful brands that you're you're 
talking about or thinking about or mentioning, um, what sets them apart from the other companies? Give us a few really um, tactical, like real stories about what you think that they're doing a little bit differently and how they're standing well, out. Well, they have, they have, I mean, the base is having product that people care about and updating it enough that there's, there's freshness consistently. But the second part of that is understanding what, how many people, who wants to buy it, how much they want to buy, and then, and then not, and not forcing, forcing the issue. And, um, I mean, that's what they all have in common. And, and, and two of the companies I, you know, I put together as similar. The other company, I'd be like, you know, they have a very broad consumer base, but, um, but they've also developed a very big direct to consumer business. So they don't need to force wholesale as much as they used to. And now I think they're finding out that they can still grow the business a lot and be much more profitable. But, but it's also the way they go to market, the way they talk to you, you know, that was Sandy If Sandy, you know, I know that Sandy wants a red shoe on, you know, she bought a red shoe a year ago. So I got to kid her. I got to get back to her. She buys a new pair of red shoes every year. I got to get back to Sandy three weeks before a year's up and say, here's the new red shoe. You're going to like Sandy. It, But I don't know about you, but I mean, you know, if some of these companies, after you buy one thing, I mean, you're barraged with emails <laughs> until the cows come home. It makes you not want to buy anything. There are some companies, though, an apparel company that does a very good job of that. You buy something, they send you a bunch of emails. And then if you don't respond... The emails really peter out. Hmm. I mean, and and I think that's good. I mean, that makes you sort of go, okay, they respect me. They know I'm not interested, and in, you know, I know they're there. And I I think you know people go, well, we have you know forty off, fifty off. And I'm like, if I didn't like it at forty off, I just really don't like whatever it is you're selling me. Wow. Um, yeah. Well, let me ask you this, Sam. Um, let's talk about the stock market. Sure. Part of- Kind of what you do on a day to day basis. I mean, we just hit thirty eight thousand. Um, it seems like we we pulled off. We being collectively, like the U.S. government and the economy, has pulled off somewhat of a soft landing. It seems um, we've got a number of footwear IPOs have happened over the last six months, a year. We got you know a couple in the in the works. Kind of talk to us about the market in twenty four, and if we were having this conversation this on on the same date in 2025 um, talk to us about when, what you might think the stock market will be at. Like, what do you expect for the year from an investment? Perspective? And I am not the broad stock market guy. I am my 16, 17 companies. I follow guy. Um, what I could say this is, I mean, I think it all goes back to what I was saying before. I, 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 I am hopeful every year that we see sort of a, a separation, sort of the good from the bad. Or I'm a, as a fan, as you met, I am a fan of the industry, regardless if I have a buy, sell, or hold on a company. I am a fan of that company. But if I see like they're missing the mark, I will be all over them, which you read my stuff, you know, I don't hold back very often. Right. Um, but I think, you know, people, again, it, it just, you know, those companies that that do the three things, execute well, have good product and, 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 uh, and so on. Um, those, those companies, you know, will do better. It, the question is, is how many of the lousy ones will go away or have to sell something and so on and so forth. And um, too many companies think that everything is about the product. But we've, I mean, I, I use this example all the time. Sandy, as an advertisement, you're, you, where, wherever you live, what's your favorite restaurant in your town? Oh, you're asking me that question right now? I'm asking you that question. Free publicity for her favorite restaurant. Oh, yeah. Restaurant. It's, it's a restaurant called, I really love going to this place called Burrow Six. Burrow Six. Now, how's the food there? Good. How's, this, how's the, the engagement you get from all the people that work there? Pretty good. The wine is really excellent. But are they treat you well. Do they know you when you product walk is, in? They know us. It's a neighborhood place. Right. They but they know, know product us. isn't king because if the food was a little bit worse, you'd still go there. But if they didn't treat you right, you'd never go there regardless of how good the food is. Right. And, and too many people 
too many of these brands and retailers think about everything relative to the food, which is the shoes in this case, versus the whole engagement package. That's true. That's you, true. It's an experience, and it's and, it's where I feel comfortable. It's where we get service. It's what we 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 know we get um, great, you know, great food and wine and experience and environment. It's a neighborhood place that we all you know we all gather and have a great time. So right and. And if that place wasn't as, if the food was the same, but the place wasn't as comfortable, it's just another place. Yeah. And yeah. and 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 I think that's what all these brands and and especially the retailers have to realize, and um and 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 give people a vision of why, you know, what what problem you're solving for your customer in a creative way, in a way that they want to be part of it. Yeah. And one one company or a brand within one company I follow, their their um, v- vision statement, I believe, was that we want to be the biggest, bestest brand within our category. That's a mission internally. That no no human being who shops for that brand gives a damn if you're helping them do that. But if you said we want, you know, there was one, and I don't want to mention brands. This was a long time ago. It's an apparel, two apparel brands. One, one brand um, had a piece of outerwear. They had on on their landing page on their website, and it po- it, it it was with arrows pointing to all the features and benefits of this jacket. And then the other brand had a guy skiing down a mountain, basically saying, "Feel the experience." I figure both those jackets are going to keep you warm, but nobody, you know, you only care about the features and benefits of it once you put it on and go, this feels really good. Is it going to keep me warm? And then you tell them about all that other stuff. And, (laughs) and, and, and historically with the feel the experience brand who, you know, makes jackets just as good as the other brand from what I can make out. Warrants a higher price. People want to spend more money for it because of that, because of the message yeah. and how they yeah. are going to market. Emotional, yeah, an emotional connection um, and experience for sure goes a long way um, with, with marketing and advertising. Well, but it also goes a lot. Forget about that. It goes a long way. If you think of, I mean, do you want me to, who, do, who wants to be put on the spot, you or Matt? I'll do it. If you volunteer. You're going to hate me for this one, Matt. Oh, no. Okay. Um, right. How long have you been married? 25 years in October. Okay. Before you met your wife, did you date other women? I did. And they were smart, funny, pretty women? For the Typically most part? not. I was, I mean, I, I started dating Lisa when I was 19. So, uh, yeah, but you know what I'm saying. You the girls they you dated. They were quite women, I'll say that. Oh, girls. I mean, I don't care. They, they were, you dated pretty nice, smart people. Girls. Sure. For the purpose of this exercise, sure. But can you put into words what it is about your wife that that you knew it was right and that has led you to being together for 25 years in a like, or did you just sort of know it when you saw it and you met, you know, you didn't do like, you didn't go through a checklist. You just said, wow, this all. Yeah, works. yeah, yeah, for sure. There was no checklist. No. That was- so. So, so that's the, that it's the same relationship with a brand to a person, uh, to a, to their customers. It's, it's not like we're going through this, all this stuff. Oh, the product's good. The product's not good. Yes, that's part of it. But usually you make such a decision in about 15 seconds. Yeah, that's fair. That's a fair point. But I mean, the product is king thing is really interesting because you hear that mantra at all times. And so I guess the question to you, Sam, is, if there's not a checklist about how you feel about a brand or how it treats you or et cetera, if you're the brand, what's the advice of what that checklist looks like internally? How do you make some? Do not pepper them. You got to really know who your customer is and then make sure that your customer is going to like the product that you're making. Because, you know, one of the companies I follow, um, uh, not in the footwear space. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Sorry. Yep. Okay. Not one of the companies that I follow, not in the footwear space, thinks they're one thing, 
but their consumers not responding to them that way. But they are so stubborn that they don't want to change the way they're they're looking at themselves. So they're not watching, and then they and and they're not changing the product up enough. So people aren't buying the new stuff, and they keep raising prices. I mean, it's so. So I tell these companies, you better know who your target audience is. I, I'm going to use a name of a company here because it doesn't matter. Hot Topics. Everybody's shopped at Hot Topics. Hot yeah. Topics, you know, did great during goth time. And then when Twilight came out, it, it did great again. But if, but if Hot Topics, if the trend all of a sudden changed to pink polo shirts and Hot Topic goes, well, you know, with the teenage kids wearing pink polo shirts now, we're going to bring in pink polo shirts. Not only would the pink polo shirt preppy kid never shop there, but it would also alienate the goth kid. It would just be a horrible decision. And, and, and they, you know, unfortunately there are less goth customer, there are less goth people out there now than there were. And that's one of the reasons why Hot Topic struggled. I mean, but, but they, but they were so narrow a focused business yeah. um, and they, they couldn't adjust it. And, but but if you but if you understand what's happening far enough ahead of time and it's on you you know you you're running these businesses um and it it just doesn't it just doesn't work and 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 I was just at a the ICR conference down in Orlando where it's a big consumer conference um uh, the second week of of January and um you know everybody was going you know what do you think of the consumer what do you think of the consumer? Well, if you're a company whose business is good, the consumer is great. And if you're a company who's not doing that well, you go, well, the consumer doesn't like this, the consumer doesn't like that. Rather than saying, the consumer may be fine, but we are not doing what we need to do to attract that consumer. And um, that is, I think, a complete bailout. And um, especially with consumer think- confidence so high, Sam, I mean, consumer confidence is very high right now. And that's another like data point to where there's demand out there. Right. Yeah. But there's demand. But that's the difference. They're, as I said, nobody's shopping. So they know what they want. Right. And 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 so and no, and, and po- like if you think about yourself pre COVID, you were, you know, you were, you know, I, I would say more forgiving to a retailer that didn't have what you wanted, a website, you'd wait till it came in. But now you're like, I want it now. This is what I want. And you better have it for me. And that's a change in the consumer. That is, that is the biggest change that they have no patience. They're exceptionally particular. And unless you as a brand or retailer have adjusted for that, you got problems. Yeah. Let's, let's talk a little bit um, in the broader sense about growth in 2024 um, in terms of wh- what were the companies saying outside, you know, coming out of that conference? Were, what were they talking about their strategies and their goals for, for growth in 24? Were they talking about M&A? Were they talking about new customer acquisitions? How, how are they talking about it? And how, what's your perspective on how they're finding growth in the new year? Well, only one company gave guidance or preliminary guidance for 24 within the companies that I follow. Everybody else didn't want to, you know, they gave an update on the current quarter with, and, and didn't really tell you what was happening next. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the company that gave the guidance, um, didn't, I don't, while I believe they're going to achieve what they're going to achieve, they they didn't necessarily provide the you know the the steps that that you need to see to get there um but in talking to that company in the past i i get the feeling they get it they are not one of those top 3 that i that i mentioned mm-hmm. but they are one that you know i believe it's all going to work but i don't think we're really going to know until sometime in second quarter Got it. Well, that's that's helpful. Um, last word on anything else, Sam, before we go, anything we didn't mention, you know, as reporters like to ask you, anything I should have asked you, uh, anything that's on your mind that we, we failed to talk about? I just think that um, you got to really, you, you, it doesn't do you as a brand or a company any good to say, well, the consumer's this or the consumer's that. And as a buyer, 
and I would assume it's still true of buyers. Um, I don't think that if businesses, you know, if the, if the, you know, if the, if the consumer's weak and your business is weak, your boss gives you a break about that. And, um, you know, that's the, um, that's the biggest thing I see. I think that you got to really look deep inside and then make the appropriate adjustments, but take responsibility for the problems that are out there, not blame it on macro. Because if you say, well, the, you know, the macro's this, the macro's that, there's really nothing you, you know, immediately there's absolutely nothing you can do about it. Yeah, that's for sure. That's for, it's, a, it's a mentality, right? And at the end of the day, a product's not king, customer's definitely king as you've kind of continued to to infer during this entire conversation so and i mean i would say this the other thing that's really important out of any company right now is sort of permanent dissatisfaction i mean i think they have to be constantly dissatisfied do not think that you know do not think they're doing anything the best they can do and Mm -hmm. um and the word maximize irks me to no end (laughs) Um, cause if I hear the word maxim, you know, it's cause you, I, I, when I hear the word maximize, I'm thinking of the price is right mountain climber game. Oh, yeah. Guess too much. You just go, plump. Pop over. And, yeah. right. And, and, and that's what I think about when I hear the word maximize and, and I don't think anybody, and anytime anybody says they're maximizes it and then have a big run, normally you see a, you see a big fall. And, um, I think optimize, you know, but continue to raise the bar. You know, if you ask somebody on a scale of one to 10, how are you doing? They say a 10, you know, it's going to be closer to two the next time you ask them. Now they should be, you know, if they're doing well, they should be permanently at like a seven or eight. Yeah. 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 Not too hot, not too cold. And there's always be always something to reach higher for. Yeah. 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 That's for sure. All right, Sam. Well, I appreciate you coming on as, as always appreciate uh, you working, you know, being a collaborator and a friend and you call balls and strikes as you see them. There's sometimes people don't like the ump or the ref, but uh, you do it with, uh, with a smile on your face and you always show up. So thanks for coming on shoe and show. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, listeners out there, shoe and show listeners, if you want to maximize your knowledge of Sam Poser, you can actually go back and listen to his prior uh, appearance with us when he talks about his shoe story we won't get into it i had two i was on twice before. yeah that's what i thought this is your third so the first time he tells us his shoe story which involves the oj and the oj trial and I mean, it's infamous but it's well worth a listen so go out and maximize or optimize your knowledge of uh, sam and you won't be sorry you did in the meantime uh, check back in with check back in with us next week as uh, as you listen into another exciting edition of Shoe and Show. And until next time, Shoe and Show is out. Shoe In has been brought to you by the FDRA, the footwear industry's association focused on retail, trade, politics, and fashion, helping create and enhance conversations on all things footwear. For information about FDRA, visit FDRA.org.